Well, today we'll be talking about tentacles, non-binary characters, and Gnosticism. And surprisingly, it's not anime. Cheers! Welcome back everybody to me talking about books and today we'll be talking about one specific book, an old book. It's over a century old so you can actually get it for free and I'll link it down below on Project Gutenberg. I mean A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay which was published in 1920. It's a very weird book. And we'll do the usual thing, which is I'll give you a quick synopsis, tell you why you should read it, or maybe why you shouldn't, because it's <clears throat> it's a bit of an acquired taste. And uh, then we'll talk about individual themes, which may be considered spoilers, but I feel it's kind of difficult to spoil a book like Voyage to Arcturus. So proceed at your own, you know, um, <laughs> idea when I give the sign for this will be the spoiler territory. And uh, yeah. Before we start, um, welcome back everybody. Um, I'm glad you're still watching this, and if you're new, I'm glad you found this. And if you want to, you know, support me a bit, there's uh, comments, there's liking, there's subscribing, there's even a Patreon and other options. Right now, if you want to send me some money on PayPal, that would be really, really great because I'm out of cash until the end of the month and I need to figure out where to buy food. Anyway, let's talk about something more fun, which is A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. So, what is A Voyage to Arcturus? Well, it's a 1920 novel um, that follows um, one character named Masco, um, who travels by weird means to a planet that is around the star Arcturus. The planet is called Torments. And he has a series of adventures there while he is trying to figure out what the hell is going on, uh, what his job and role in this universe is, and so forth. It becomes very, very symbolic very quickly. It is extremely weird. I can tell you that. It's one of the un most unique, weird experiences you'll find in that kind of fantasy. And... Um, it has very little plot and very little characterization. It's all more on the philosophical, symbolic side of things. Should you have ever read something like William Blake? <laughs> you might recognize ideas there. Have you ever read something like Clark Ashton Smith? Well, some of the weirdness in the descriptions of the planet um, kind of hark, uh, well, may have influenced um, uh, Clark Ashton Smith there. There's there's parallels there. Arthur Machen might have been another influence there in some of his weirder stuff as well. So that's the kind of territory we're in. And that's why I said it might not just be for everyone, because if you're only used to contemporary fantasy that is very heavily focused on a very, you know, sometimes convoluted blo uh, plot with a lot of magic system and characters that are, well, if not well-rounded, at least, um, do show signs of, you know, weaknesses, strengths, inner worlds, stuff like that. <laughs> you don't get it here, because that's not the point of the book. It's way more of an extended allegory, an extended fever dream. It has a very, very weird, surreal atmosphere, and um, it sometimes reads a bit like, um, well, a Christian allegory. Some people have even compared it to A Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, but don't worry, this is not Christian. It is very very much not Christian. We'll get back to that later on. But as I said, I think it's worth reading. It's incredibly unique. It's uh, thought-provoking. It will certainly leave <laughs> you with weird and odd memories, I can tell you that. Um, but yeah, it, be aware of what you're getting yourself into. It's a bit like a trip. Um, I have not tried this on any chem uh, chemicals, but I am uh, sure they will not actually make it <laughs> any better or worse. Um, so these are the reasons why you should go and read A Voyage to Arcturus. It has had a huge impact on other uh, fantasy writers, so for historical reasons there alone, it has certainly influenced both C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien and a lot of other people afterwards. So um, yeah. There's reasons to read this book, and, well, one of them is that it is free because there's no copyright on it anymore. And I'll link the um, ebook on Project Gutenberg down below so you can even get it for free and read it. You will not, re well, <laughs> maybe you'll regret the experience, but it will be an experience that is well worth um, having. So these are the reasons why you should go and read it. And <laughs> I hope I haven't scared you away. I have a bit of a bear, and then we'll talk about some of the reasons and ways to maybe look at the book and try to get answers of what the hell it actually means. All right, everyone back. 
great. I hope you enjoyed the book. I hope you're wondering what you just read. <laughs> That's certainly worth um, doing in this regard. And um, let's look at why I think this book is so unique, why it does have, I feel, a lot of, you know, it, it rings very weird chords with a lot of people and is very difficult to forget for a lot of people, including me. And I think there's reasons why that is. And some of it is certainly the dreamlike quality, the very, very stylized language that it has in parts. Some of these stylistic choices do play a role, but I think the underlying issue is um, that it reads like philosophy or theology, and it wrestles with like one major question, and that is the question of good and evil. Um, there's certainly an aspect of like freedom of will going on there and it has a very unique very unique answer to it in a lot of ways and almost a mystic answer to it in a way and i think that's partly what makes it such a good book so why is that now as i said it is why it was published in 1920 and david lindsay although relatively old at the time um was called to serve in world war one which took part from a place from 1914 to 1918 as you're probably aware and it did certainly scar a lot of people because wars are bad. Um, among the people scarred by it were, you know, J.R. Tolkien in part, um, Robert Graves, <laughs> David Lindsay. Um, we'll not talk about the other ones that then uh, decided to start another war. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it certainly changed a lot of um, uh, people's view of the world. It upset society in a lot of ways. It's, you know, People sometimes claim that the 19th century basically went all the way to 1914 and the war basically ended that part of human Western society, um, Western culture and outlook on the world. It is a bit of a paradigm shift, to put it mildly, or a, well, rupture or whatever you want to call it. And artists that came through that did certainly um, use their skill as art, um, in art, as writers, painters, and so forth, to sort of deal with all the um, all the backlash and all these experiences that um, certainly scarred them for life. You can find this in Tolkien. You certainly find it in the poetry of someone like Robert Graves. You find it in actually, you know, war novels like Nothing New on the Western Front, stuff like that. And David Lindsay certainly seems to have well, had his own issues in trying to deal with it. And I think that's where the question of good and evil comes in, that does take, is relatively strong in this book, and the question of um, how to atone or who's responsible for crimes, for murder, for causing deaths, um, there's your tie back to World War I, I guess, and how to figure this whole thing out. And here's what makes A Voyage to Arturus stand out so much, for me at least, because well, Maskell, the guy, and let's just idea, look at the name here, because names mean something here, because we're talking symbolism and stuff like that. He's called Maskell. That's very close to masculinity. Yes, it's spelled with a K. I'm aware of that. But I think it is very much the idea of having Maskell stand in as the generic man in that regard. And I think that's one start. And once he's on Arcturus, he goes through like a series of encounters that are always driven by that question of like where to go, what to do, and um, how to atone um, or deal with the fact that he has caused death. Was he responsible for the uh, deaths that he caused? Was someone else? Was he following orders? <laughs> These kind of questions. And Lindsay does wrestle with all of that because if there is, you know, a system, if this world is created by someone, in a way, <laughs> then that someone, that creator, should probably have some form of responsibility. Or is there full-on free will? Who knows? These are the questions that Lindsay wrestles with, and he does so with what fantasy can do, what allegory can do, because allegory, as much as Tolkien hated it, does have one thing that it, you know, delivers to um, these moral problems um, that um, uh, Lindsay is wrestling with, and that is the, pro the, the skill of, or the um, form of alienation. We'll talk about that in a second. See, <clears throat> in theory, all, philos uh, all literature does a wrestle or give us the opportunity to wrestle with questions of philosophy and psychology and so forth. But fantasy can transport these into weird places and thus, one, literalize um, metaphors, make them, you know, explicit in fantasy, but it also does um, provide a different plane, a different yeah, level on which to discuss these things. And thus Maskell, 
His travels through torments are exactly that. His, his actual body changes through time. The world is really surreal in that. <laughs> what, a, what a sentence. The world is surreal in this one. And it does focus on these moral questions in a way that something set in our world might probably not work as well because it would probably be distracting to have all these um, uh, preconceived notions about how certain societies work and so forth. Without that, we can focus on these moral questions and maybe gain something through that strangeness, which is exactly what A Voyage to Arcturus does, what Lindsay does, because holy shit, this one's strange. Now, the question is, how do we interpret that? And there's different ways of doing that, I guess. Um, one is certainly a more um, psychological framing. Now, you, if you look at, say, the 1920s, this is when psychoanalysis and Jungian depth psychology have become very, very popular, or at least are starting to become very popular, and people think in these ways. When you look at Maskell's development throughout a voyage um, um, to Arcturus, it's more like his faculty is changing. We start out with Joywind and her husband and a society that is very much um, um, all about, in, you know, joy and um, pleasure and not causing any harm and so forth. It's a very emotional aspect, which is where Maskell has his very specific um, sense organs, like that change throughout the novel, like the tentacle, the mon, or however it's um, pronounced, actually, um, that can actually be used to, um, well, you know, feel emotions and share emotions in very unique ways. And the fact that it could also probably be read as an umbilical cord does sort of um, lead to the idea that this is where, this is where um, the life, the emotional life, the intellectual life, the, the of the soul, so to speak, starts. And that changes in the next stage when he has to change his, or he changes his um, um, tentacle to a third arm that is very much about will and desire. See, where the first one is about uh, free sharing, it changes to greed and to wanting to possess and using the will to um, to achieve that, which is where, well, personality, what you might, in, psychological, in psychoanalytical Freudian terms, might call um, the, uh, the ego does kind of come in. And, and then he moves from that. Once he realizes that he has um, done these things, um, he tries to find ways to atone or figure out how to um, rein in his pure just will and greed and need to possess. And that's uh, where the internet, you know, a discussion of duty comes in. It, 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 in that way, it does read like a progression through, um, well, growing up and maturing in, of the soul in a way, going through these different stages of evolution of um, that most children should probably go through in a way. So we have all of these very much personified and made very explicit. That and that's one way you can read this entire um, this entire story as the growing up of a personality, the developing of a personality through all these outside influences that. Um, drag us in all kinds of directions while we are trying to figure out who we are, ever moving onwards, because at the end of the day, the whole story, the travel, is there's not much motivation behind him, uh, Masculine, going through torments, right? He's like, he's there, he wants to find uh, Crag and Nightspore, the other guys that he's with, he wants to find them again, but he, um, mostly he just keeps moving on, because moving on the, the, is just something that happens naturally, and he comes through dif different um, places and situations, and uh, does try to figure these out, and try different approaches to... Uh, living his life. None of those really working that well, to put it mildly. So that's that's one way of reading the book, and I think it does work in that way, because once again, it does not give us a definite answer at the end. Even once we're at the actual end, Maskell is dead, it's Night Spore again, and Night Spore is talking to Crag, and Crag is just giving him more questions. Um, yeah, there's no definite answer, which is sort of the strength and also the frustrating part about A Voyage to Arcturus. Something that, say, um, C.S. Lewis in Perilandra did try to rectify by uh, using the uh, these ideas and the questions, which are real, and, and trying to, you know, divert them in, in, into a very, a very Christian um, moral framework, which is, obviously, I mean, he was a believer, so that, that makes sense. <laughs> but... Lindsay leaves that completely open. It's like, we have to make these ideas up ourselves. It's not an external thing that is happening. 
So that is one way of interpreting um, a voyage to Arcturus, and I really appreciate that one. There is, however, a second one, which is the more mystical one, the uh, Gnostic one. Now, I guess we need to talk about Gnostics for a second here. Gnostic, Gnosticism is one strain of uh, religion. It's a radical dualism, in a way. It's been around for a long time, and <laughs> some people have called it Manichaeism uh, after the, um, well, Manichaean um, uh, religious sect or um, belief system that you might whatever you want to call it. Later on, the Cathars and some others, the Bogomils in what is now Bosnia, subscribed to a Christian dualism. There are other Gnostic sects and ideas, but what it boils down to is that there are basically two deities. There is a, well, a creator, and then there is the Demiurge. And our world that we live in, the physical world, is not the creation of God. It's actually the creation of, well, in the Christian version of the Cathars and so forth, it is the creation of the devil. So physical existence and the enjoyment of physical pleasure, the seeking of physical pleasures and so forth, is actually evil. And freedom can only come if we abandon all of that and possibly die. It can go into all kinds of really weird directions, but the ongoing conversation within a voyage um, to Arcturus, the question of like, who is Crystal Man, is um, Torments actually the product of Crystal Man or of Surtur? Um, is is this being, well, this world full of pleasures that are, uh, that uh, Maskell starts in with Joywind and her husband, is that is that actually the creation of a Crystal Man or is that the creation of a Surtur? Well, Joywind certainly believes it's Surtur, but it can be questions whether it might not be actually that physical world that we all enjoy. And a lot of these stages that... Um, Maskell goes through are ah, very much about finding out that the physical world is in fact um, not perfect and it, it does actually cause harm and it does lead to that to the questioning and abandoning of all of that and trying to leave it all behind which is you know when near the end Maskell just wants to die now obviously <laughs> it doesn't end like that and uh, Maskell becomes Nightspore again and Nightspore has to go back and start it all over again there is that idea of rebirth which you have are forced through until you can actually move out which may sound eastern and well the 19th century and the early 20th century certainly was also the time of a lot of occultists and esoteric uh, belief systems arriving in the west taking whatever they thought they had understood about it you know, Buddhism or Hinduism, taking the, these ideas and turning them into theosophy, um, anthroposophy, uh, whatever, the Steiner thing, anthroposophy, um, and all these other weird um, belief systems. And suddenly um, the idea of rebirth is kind of built into that. So we have that very mystical, almost theological approach, which is another question of like, if you come back traumatized from a trench war, maybe figuring out that this world actually sucks and cannot be the creation of a good creator does kind of come home. So it's it's another version of that. Um, and it's once again, it's not a definite answer. It's Yes, you can read it in that Gnostic way and look for theology <laughs> to figure out what is going on. I think that... That is a second way of interpreting. So we have, on the one hand, the psychological, like, like all of we, what we go through, all the um, stresses, all the uh, trauma, is basically our, psych our psyche, our self developing, being forced to reckon with all these different uh, situations and questioning those and trying to find out what is the good life, what is good, which is very much what Maskell starts out doing and then figuring out that he has done something that he believes is wrong, trying to find atonement for that and trying to find an answer. That's one the psychology one that we talked about is that first one. The second one is that more theological one where we try to figure out why is the world in, the, in which we live like that? Yes, we change from just wanting desire to finding ways to curb that desire, finding duty, discipline, all of these questions. That's the more psychological or psychoanalytical way of looking at it. And the second one is the more mystical one. Why is the world like this? I'm ending up with dualism, but maybe that's also not the answer. And that, I think, is where the third part comes in, and one that I find very, very unique and very interesting for a book written in 1920. Let's just assume for once that the answer might just be that we are who we are, and we have to make that our, ourselves. And there's ways you can find that in there. It's a more like Nietzschean, asserting our will kind of thing, 
that goes beyond just that second stage in the voyage where you can use your will to dominate others, but it's more like trying to decide for ourselves. And there's interesting questions here that are tied to gender, because the world does still sort of or in Arcturus, does still kind of build on that gender binary, but it's not quite there. It's not quite there. And it's very much ahead of its time in that regard, in an artistic way. Once there is a Joy Wynn's husband, whose name I have forgotten, uh, who tells about that story that um, he, well, he was both uh, female and male up to a point where he decided to become one. And he decided to be a male at that point. But that's a decision that he wished that he knowingly took and willingly took. Um, and that, that, I think, is very interesting and important here. Later on, we meet that uh, non-binary creature that does even have its own neo-pronouns, which certainly was um, fairly unique for an English-language uh, novel written in 1920. But it once again deals with the quest, uh, fact that our personalities do have those different elements. And when you tie that back to ideas of psychoanalysis by Freud and others about how there are female and male aspects in our personality, the fear of castration, all of these elements that are tied to Freudian nonsense, to put it mildly. Um, they are explored here in a very interesting way, saying that it is up to a point our choice, how we assert ourselves, our, our essence, in a way, is up to us. Now, is it conscious? Probably not, or not not fully, but it is something that is unique and is not predestined by uh, by biology. There is that dualism between um, well, soul and um, the the physical creation again. I think it it's sort of where these two things are tied to together. The um, psycho psychological uh, psychic journey of becoming who we are on the one hand, and the uh, more dualist or Gnostic universe of having a soul on the one hand and having a physical world that that soul needs to navigate with the tools that it is given. It's where these two things are tied together and they make this once again feel so unique it's it's a fever dream of someone trying to find out if all the things that he did were actually necessary <laughs> warranted or even um you know his own fault and finding out that up to a point yes they were his own fault and he can just yeah hope that he gets the chance to try again or um, give all of this up because there's a lot of, you know, pressure of having to reckon with all these external problems, having to be in situations that force you to die or kill. <laughs> these things will leave a mark, these will, things will leave a scar. And that's, that's at the core of a voyage to Arcturus. Us coming to terms, or someone, in this case a writer, coming to terms with the fact that life means you inflict suffering, you need to reckon with that, you need to re take responsibility for that because maybe listening to others does not necessarily help in those situations. It's something that, at the end of it all, you need to, well, come to terms with yourself there. And then, well, you probably could go and try it again. Now, these are just some thoughts on a voyage to Arcturus. It's, as I said, it's completely open. It does not give a final answer there. It just leaves more questions. But in that regard, I think it does what great art could do, what Someone like William Blake did in his ideas, um, taking different passions, different, different aspects of personality and turning them into actual characters. Lindsay does a similar thing in a more, um, in the framework of what you might call a, almost a pulp story. As I said, the, some of the descriptions of the planet reminded me a lot of Clark Ashton Smith. Um, so it does all of these things in a very unique 1920s way. And the fact that it is so raw and so honest and does not provide any easy answers, I think that's what touches um, me as a reader, at least, which makes me think about it more and more and trying to think, figure it out. There is that need to figure it out, and there is no answer but the one that I come up with, and that answer may change over time. Probably it'll change with every reread I do. But that's the strength of the, this novel, that it does not give us answers, it just gives us questions. And it uses these different techniques um, of the psychoanalytical one, of the mystical one, which are, at that time, the, the, the endings up to a point of the 19th century, especially the occult, um, esoteric aspect. That's, a, that's 19th century stuff. Psychoanalysis starts in the 19th century and is certainly changed throughout the 1920s after World War I, but it is also a science of the um, fin de siècle times, in a way. And A Voyage to Arcturus is David Lindsay trying to use the tools that he grew up with, trying to use these tools to tackle a situation that is completely new. 
and those tools aren't adequate. And that leads to that openness at the end. And I think that's, that's what makes it so unique and so powerful. I certainly will reread it a lot of times, I'm sure of that. And I'm not sure if I'll ever get an answer out of it, but it, it'll always be an interrogation and a journey for myself. And that's what makes this book so powerful. These are my thoughts on A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay. Now go and read it if you haven't. If you have read it, let me know what you thought about it. Um, I'd love to hear from you um, down in the comments. We can argue about it. We can compare notes, that kind of stuff. Please like, subscribe, um, share the video if you feel someone else might um, profit from it. And if you feel like actually supporting me uh, monetarily, as I said, there's some links down below. And I'm, I'm always glad for any of these things. And... Mostly I'm just glad you watched this, and for that, I'll say thanks and cheers.